happy to be here. Good morning. Good morning. There you are. All right, let's wake the neighbors up, shall we? So, uh, let's open with a word of prayer, and then we'll start our message. Father, we thank you that you're with us right now. We thank you for the wonderful weather you've blessed us with. We thank you for every Sunday that was not raining so we could meet together in fellowship. Father, we thank you for the ability to be here. We thank you for the lives we have. We thank you for the health that we have right now. And we ask blessing upon this day and this service. In your name we pray. Amen. All right. So for the last two weeks, we have talked about having inner peace. When the world around us has turmoil, how do we keep inner peace? Because that keeps us in line with God. Shows God that we have trust in Him, we have faith in Him, and that we love Him. Now we're going to look at how we can keep peace with Jesus. And we're going to be looking in the book of Revelation, chapter 2, 1 through 7. So if you have your Bibles, go to chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. And if your neighbor doesn't have his Bible, just thump him real hard on the shoulder. Alrighty, so let me give you a brief background about this church. It's called Ephesus. It was started by the Athenian Greeks, then adopted by the Roman Empire when they took over the Greek Empire. This is a key port in the area, so it's a metropolis. It's like New York City. It has access through land routes and water routes, so everyone wants to be there. It's huge. It's got a lot of philosophies, different kinds. And, of course, if you know the Romans, they don't care, as long as you all get along, what you believe. That's how they feel. They feel like that just keeps the peace. Let everyone believe whatever they want. As long as everyone can get along, we're good. So then Paul comes into that region and starts the church. He plants the seed. Well, Paul is dead now, and John is given the task to take over that church. He's the waterer and the overviewer of it. So John's task, here is Ephesus, start helping it stay on track. And then John, we know, ends up on Patmos, where he's now on a prison island like Australia used to be. So if you know your history, you kind of have an idea of what John was going through. So John says this. He's sitting on the island one day, and God gives him a revelation. And he says, I want you to write this stuff down. And that's where we're at in Revelation 2, 1 through 2. And it starts like this. To the angel of the church of Ephesus, write. These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work, your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. If we want to keep peace with Jesus, we hear the first three things that we need to know. The first one is this. Jesus says, I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. When I was a child at my parents' house, I was the neat freak, as they would say. If something got moved and put away, they knew it was me. And there was three reasons. One, I was bored. Two, I have OCD. So growing up, when my siblings would leave stuff lying around, or my mom or my dad, after a while I got a little, can't handle that. i got to put that where it belongs, or where I think it needs to be. The third thing is, growing up with other siblings, I wanted praise. Being the oldest, I was just assumed that I was going to do these things. My little brother or little sister, if they picked up their room, oh, good job, you picked up your room. So I would pick up my room, make it spotless, change things around, clean the bathrooms, do the dishes, pull the weeds out of the flower bed, or pick up sticks out of the yard before my dad would mow. I would do all these things that you wouldn't think a kid would normally do without being asked, just so I was not bored, the OCD in me kicked in, or I was hoping to get praise. Now, once in a while, the recognition would get told to me, oh, you know, you did an exceptional job tonight doing the dishes without being asked, or, you know, you... We understand it was your brother's turn, but, you know, you did it for him. Good job. So those were the reasons I cleaned my parents' house for him when they were both working, and I did things. Jesus had John write these things to the Ephesus church, these three points, so that they understood they were being watched. And the deeds they were doing were not going unseen. 
I hear people tell me all the time, you know, I did this and I did this, but I don't think anyone ever noticed. Especially teenagers. When I worked with teenagers, they would come and, and tell me, you know, I did this for my room today, or I did this for my mom, and she never noticed. And I said, well, how do you know she never noticed? And they're like, well, she didn't say anything. I said, does your mom always have to praise you every time you do anything? Well, it would be nice. I said, but then you're just doing it for the praise. Do it because you want to do it and you want to make her happy. So Jesus is letting them know, look, I see what you're doing. I'm watching every little deed and every big deed you do. And you've not asked me to send you praise, but I want to let you know every moment, every hour, every day, I see everything you do for me. Nothing goes past my sight that I don't know what's going on. So good job. You've not heard it, but I want to let you know now, good job. Thank you. I love that you're doing this. It's keeping peace between me and you. The second thing is your perseverance. I understand where you're at. Trust me. When I walk through Jerusalem, I face the same problems you're facing. You're facing persecution from Greeks. I face persecution from Sadducees. You're facing persecution from Jews. I face persecution from the Pharisees. You're facing persecution from Rome? Well, I faced it too. And I'm glad you're not giving in to the temptation to curse them. I'm glad you're not giving in to the temptation to retaliate. I'm glad that you're praying for them. I hear your prayers. You're surviving the persecution because you're in the toughest spot of all. You're in a spot where everyone feels that Christianity is the most bogus thing to live by. All these other philosophies are being taught, and everyone thinks you guys are idiots. But good job for not giving in. Good job for not cursing them. Good job for not getting in fights. Good job. That is keeping the peace between me and you. Excellent. And then he says, I see and I know you cannot tolerate wicked people that you have tested. Those who claim to be apostles, but you are not, and have found them false. And then in verse 6, if you go down to verse 6, we're going to see something else here. But you have this in your favor as well. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, who, which I also hate. There's few things that God hates, but apparently these Nicolaitans, he hates them. Jesus says, on top of you, not listening to false witnesses, listening to false doctrine. And if someone says, hey, I got a new message, you're testing to make sure they're accurate with the word of God. You're also looking at these Nicolaitans and saying, uh-uh, we will not give in to you. And here's why. Have you ever wondered who these Nicolaitans were? Have you done your research when you read this? Because these people fit into our society today perfectly. They were a sect who would hijack other groups and hide behind these other groups' ways of life just to get in so that they could cause chaos. They would sneak in and say, oh, we want to be like you. Then they get in, and then they'd hijack their beliefs, turn the people against the community that they didn't like, and attack them through this group and hide behind this group. They would breathe hateful doctrine. They believed that they were the only ones who deserved to have the rights to make rules and live where they lived. And everyone else was below them. So they would look at these Christians and say, hey, look, we see you're teaching peace. You're winning people over to you. You're the best movement so far going on. We'd like to join you. And yet the Christians in Ephesus said, we know who you are. We know all about you. We will not let you join us and infiltrate our church and ruin our reputation." They practiced terrorist actions. They practiced disruptive behaviors. They did all this, and then when, when the Rome would come in, they'd say, well, it wasn't us. It was this group over here that did it. This group over here started it, not us. So they do all these crazy things, breathe hateful doctrine, practice hateful deeds, and then when the organization they were with got in trouble, they turn on them, and say, oh, absolutely. And then they start spreading falseness against that group and try and join another group so that the arrows and the finger pointing was never on them. And that's what they were doing. 
And now, if you were Christians at that time and you were being persecuted, you would probably want a group that could defend you and make you look good for a little bit. And everyone else was scared of. But they said, absolutely not. We don't want that. That is not what we want. So Jesus is saying, here's the third positive. You didn't allow wicked men to be leadership. You didn't allow wicked men to come in and teach. You refused them. No matter what they offered you, you refused to let them do any have any responsibility, do any sway over the church. You didn't mind that they sat in the pew, didn't mind that they sat in the conference, but as long as they didn't try to teach or put a sway, that's a good thing, no matter what they offered you. They worked at their beliefs. They understood what they had to believe and what they could and couldn't allow to be taught. So Jesus says, that's great. You have great overseers. You're watching yourselves. This is great. This is great. But I have a problem with you. He moves on into verse 4. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love. You have forsaken your first love. Do you remember the first day you took your spouse on a date? Do you remember that day? How clear is that in your head? What was your stomach like? Was it full of butterflies? Was it anxious? Were you nervous that you were going to do something wrong? Or were there sparks? I'm pretty sure it was a mix of all of it. You had sparks going on. You were nervous. When you dated your spouse, you were hopeful that they would like you and you would like them. You couldn't wait to talk to them via a phone or in person. You wrote letters back and forth probably as well. Now, I know I didn't do so much, but my wife did. One, 20. That was the ratio. So writing letters, you, you desired to get to know them. You couldn't wait to find out what they liked and didn't like. You couldn't wait to find things to give them to show, hey, I love you. I appreciate you. You couldn't wait to spend time with them. Any time apart was miserable for you. Those were the days when you knew your first love and you desired your first love. Those were the days when it was all exciting. Now, we all know that those, what we call puppy love feelings, mature and take different forms and as spouses sometimes we forget to remember to take our spouse on a date like we used to because you know we've done that for years so hey we forget to tell them in the morning i love you sometimes just because we already assume they know that same things going on here same exact thing jesus says look you've forsaken your first love you've forgotten to continue to grow in your relationship You've forgotten what it takes to keep that relationship going. You've went on autopilot. And that's where the church of Ephesus is. They're on autopilot with Jesus. They worked so hard to get where they are, and things are going well for them that they, like, click autopilot. Now, we don't have to worry about anything. We're good. He says you've lost your fervor, your spark. It's like getting a desired Christmas gift. One you've always wanted, and you get it. And you cherish it for about six months. You really love this. And then, by the next Christmas, well, there's something else that sparks your attention more. And this one kind of goes on a shelf or in the kitchen somewhere. Maybe it's a cup or a coffee mug or, or a tool or a fishing pole or a new gun or whatever it is. But that's, that's old. I'm ready for something new. That's where they're at right now. They had that spark. They had that desire for Jesus. They were all in for it. And now it's waned. The church of Ephesus at this time, when Paul started a church, was so excited. They were thrilled that they had a new life, a new hope. But that was under Paul's watch. John comes in, and John's a little more lax with his overview. He's not as strong as Paul was. Paul was in your face all day long. John was a little more casual. He's like, yeah, you know, let's be friends. And, and nothing wrong with that. But this church needed a hard fist all the time because where they lived. 
And so Jesus says, look, you've lost your first love. You're playing church. You're following the rules. You're doing the deeds, and you're watching out for sin, but there's nothing in here. There's no joyful worship going on. There's no joyful praise to me going on. There's no joyful messages being taught about me. You're just kind of on autopilot. You just go to church just to go to church, just so you know that's the thing you're supposed to do. You're not going there because you want to see Jesus, you want to meet Jesus, you want to let him know how appreciative you are. That's what Jesus has against them. And he has some solutions for them. In verse 5, remember the height from which you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. So, what Jesus is saying is, remember what your life was like before knowing me? Do you remember walking the streets of Ephesus and seeing all these other gods and worshiping them, but yet not feeling anything, not, reali not feeling like anything's going to happen for you? You're just hitting this religion and you're hitting this religion, and you're bouncing back and forth, and there's no joy in your life. Do you remember that? And then do you remember the day that I was introduced to you? And you realize, wow, this is the real thing. This isn't the fake thing. Do you remember that day? Do you remember the joy you felt when you first met me? When me and you joined together in baptism? And you came up and realized you were a new creation? Do you remember that day? Do you remember the peace that you first felt when you met me? When your life was in turmoil and you didn't feel like anything, any hope in the world at all. There was only chaos and despair and depression. And then you met me and you realized there was hope and there is joy and there is an end that is going to end with a joyful celebration. Do you remember those days? Do you remember the peace you felt every night as you went to sleep because you knew you knew me and I was watching out for you? Do you remember those nights? Do you remember the joy you felt when you woke up a new day and a new opportunity to witness for me and to rejoice with me and knowing I'm walking with you that day? No matter what goes on in your community, you knew I was with you. Do you remember those days? Do you remember when it was better, you could do better and it was a better day when afflictions hit you and you didn't stress over it? You're like, oh well, big deal. My Savior went through that and more. I can do that. But now you're in those days that when you go to bed at night, you're stressing. When you wake up in the mornings, you're dreading. And when you get hit by afflictions, you're like, oh, wow, that's a heavy hit. He says, do you remember those days before that? Because that's where you're at right now, church. Do you remember when it was easier to think about death? Because you knew death was just a move on to a greater thing. Yet, when you're in Ephesus, you hear about death. Well, there's all kinds of Greek philosophies. There's Roman philosophies. And there's other cultures going on. And so they're thinking about that. And he says, look, you have forgotten the promise I promised you when you die. You live eternally with me. It's not another place. You don't have to have gold to go there. You don't have to have riches to go to this new land. You have nothing but this joy that you and I share together. This life you and I share together. But you've forgotten that. Do you remember how strong your desire to reach heaven was? Man, it's the only goal they could think of at the first. Man, we want to get to heaven. We want to get... But then, that became old news. So then their lives became autopilot. Yeah, so, yeah, there's heaven. I'm sure I'll get there eventually. Not a main goal of mine right now. My main goal is to, to get myself through the next week. My main goal is to, to make money to have this or have that. My main goal is to have kids. My main goal is to get married. My main goal is something other than doing what I need to do to get to heaven and keeping peace with my Savior. That's where the Ephesus church was. And Jesus says, I want you to remember. You need to keep remembering. I am your first love and what got us there. Once you can remember, then there's a second part to the remedy. And that is, Inwardly grieve. Remember he said, repent and do these things. Inwardly grieve and be truly ashamed of your situation you put yourself in. You have to say, Jesus, I am truly sorry. That's what he's told these Ephesians. 
You have to say you're sorry. And you have to inwardly grieve that you've allowed yourself to go on autopilot. You've allowed yourself to let stress and strife and the influences of the world around you to affect that inner peace that I've called you to have, which shows trust in me, which shows hope in me, and which shows you love me. You have to inwardly grieve that loss as if it was a loved one that you've lost. Then you have to take personal blame. Because what I see here in this church is they're blaming each other. Well, I followed his example. I followed her example. I followed one of our leaders' example. Jesus says, no, I want you to take personal, personal blame for this. It's, you put yourself in that situation. You allowed yourself to get in that situation. You allowed yourself to lose your first love. No one else could draw you out of that. That's your personal journey, and that's your fault. So you have to say, hey, you know, I'm sorry. I did this. I'm sorry, Holy Spirit. I allowed myself to go that path when you probably were trying to encourage me not to. <clears throat> then you have to humbly confess your situation in the ears and the sight of God. You have to be willing to approach God at his throne and say, God, I was an idiot. God, I should have never done that. And I apologize wholeheartedly. My fault. I, I really beg your forgiveness. And then you have to restart your journey. You have to start over again, just like the day you decided you wanted to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You have to get back down to that level of joy, that level of inquiring, that level of thirst, that level of hunger. Start it over again. He's telling these officials, yes, you might be a leader in the church, but act like you're a new guy walking in. You might be the, the strongest Christian in the group, but get back to where you were the weakest. And you want to be that strongest person again. So start back from ground zero. Set the clock back to zero is what he's telling them. When you do these things, Jesus says, you'll keep peace with me. This is what it takes to keep peace with Jesus. Never get comfortable where we're at. Never put ourselves on autopilot. Never forget that he is our first and only true love that matters to us. And I'm not saying don't love your spouses. You should. Because the Bible says, treat your spouse as you would Jesus. So when we look at these things, they're doing great, aren't they? They're keeping the faith literal by obeying all the commands of Jesus and not letting false teaching come into them and sway them in any way that should not be. They're doing good deeds for Jesus. And they're persevering by not cursing those who are persecuting them. Which Jesus says, that's all the ways if you want to keep peace with me. Those are primary. But in doing all those actions... Don't forget who you're serving. Don't forget who you're doing it for. Because I'm feeling neglected, he says. I'm feeling left out. You're busy, 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 busy. But you're not talking to me. You're not walking with me. Tom. Oh. <laughs> We're going to hold on for a train. is he on? Is he on this one here? Good. Keep going. Keep going. This is the blessing of a deaf ear. I can barely hear him. But he sounds like he's way over there. Now y'all look comfortable in the shade. Y'all good for another hour? Alrighty, so are we good? Can you hear me now? Tom, can you hear me? Talk louder? Alright, so we're at the conclusion of the message today, and after this we're going to go into communion time, and Bob will give us a devotional thought. But what I want to conclude with, and I've already been talking about, is if we want to keep peace with Jesus, we have to take ownership of the things we do wrong. We have to seek forgiveness for the times we do wrong. And we have to start every day new. We can't assume Jesus is going to walk with us. We have to ask him. We can't assume Jesus knows our problems for the day. We have to talk to him from the get-go. We have to say, Jesus, it's a brand new day. I'm a brand new person in your sight every day. Help me through this day as if I've never asked you before. I know you're going to do it, but I want to connect with you first. 
I want you to know you're the first person I rely on every day. You're the first person I love every day. Help me, Jesus. Help me to be genuine with you. Help me to love you like the first day I was. Help me to be excited like the first day I was to know you. At this time, Bob's going to come up and give us our devotional thought. And if you have, if you need communion, raise your hand and I'll bring it around. Well, wait, 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 wait till after Bob because I won't remember. In times like these, we truly do need a Savior. I guess that song uh, struck me this morning, uh, thinking about that song in the stress that we've all experienced you know, for the last several months. Uh, sometimes we, uh, we find ourselves at a loss, not knowing what to say, not knowing what to, to pray even. With floods and hurricanes and fires and social unrest in our cities, killings every day on TV. Uh, as we sit in this beautiful backyard on uh, such a, a wonderful morning, uh, it's nice to set those thoughts aside and that stress aside at least for a while while we're here with our church family. I know uh, when I was a kid and went to YMCA camp, we had an outdoor chapel. And uh, from then on, worshiping outdoors, or at least you know, being outdoors and, and thinking about God, experiencing his uh, creation, has always been special. And I hope you enjoy these uh, outdoor services, and I hope the weather holds all through the winter. Uh, <laughs> one of these days we will have to go back indoors. But again, with all that goes on around us, uh, sometimes it's difficult to know uh, even what to pray for. And the Bible speaks to that. Uh, the scriptures that I have this morning, just two from Romans uh, 8, 26, and 27. Um, speak uh, to that feeling that we have at times. And Paul writes, In the same way the Spirit helps us in our weakness, we do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans, and he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for this beautiful morning. And again, we, uh, we feel the warmth of the sun on us and the gentle breeze watch the blue skies and the, and the wonderful clouds that we have this morning and we have a peace that we wish we could carry throughout the day throughout the week uh, throughout our lives but lord in times like these we truly need a savior and we thank you for your patience with us and uh, we remember the words that were spoken that say when two or more of your followers get together, this do in remembrance of me. So this morning on this beautiful day, we lift up the cup that symbolizes the blood that you shed for us and consume the bread that represents your broken body that you sacrificed so much that we might have the relief from sin that we all carry too much. Lord, again, we thank you for your patience with us. We ask for a blessing over 
our church of 131 years in this community. We ask your blessing and healing touch for those of us that are feeling hurt physically or emotionally, that are suffering pains that only you can heal. And uh, Lord, we ask that you give us the strength and the courage and the will to carry your work on here in this community, that others might know the love and the forgiveness that you've offered to us. Again, Lord, we ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Bob, if you'll help me. If you'll raise your hand, if I get near you. Request. Anyone have any prayer requests? Yes. Marna Ritter still. Okay. All righty. How are you doing, by the way? So, so, so we'll keep you on our prayer list too. I'm glad to see you're walking good today. And, and Carolyn, did I hear something about your husband? Eyes or anything? Or who were you talking about? Oh, no? Okay. My brother Dennis, he's going for his surgery next month. Okay. Please keep prayers for him. His brother's having surgery on his cancer, so anyone else? Bob Fars? Bob? His mother. His mother, okay, I'm sorry. He had a stroke. Really? I had yeah. not heard that yet, okay. All right, so his mom had a stroke. Bob Fosno's mom. So anyone else? Yes, Bob. Okay. So his neighbor Jerry. All right. No others. Let's uh, close in prayer, and then y'all have just a wonderful day. Thank you for attending. Thank you for watching. Father, we thank you for watching over us this week. We thank you for giving us better weather this day and the week coming. We count that as such a great blessing. Father, we also count that your blessings upon us that we have health. 
that we have the ability to be here. Father, we lift up the names that were mentioned. Um, Bob Fosno's mom, with her stroke, be with that family as they have to work with her and give them the strength and the ability to do just that. Father, we pray for Marna as she still needs healing to her body. We pray for uh, Dwayne's brother with the cancer that he's facing and the surgeries that are needed. We pray for that family as well. And Father, we just lift up the uh, Bob Robertson's neighbor and that you will give him healing to his body and keep him safe while he's fighting the uh, virus. And Father, we pray for the safeties of our schools and the workers who have to work in them. And Father, we just lift up all the needs that were mentioned today and ask for your blessing and your healing. And we dismiss in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. All right, thank you very much for attending. You can socialize at a distance, wave at each other.